Well, as we continue in our study of prophecy tonight, we're reminded that passionate pursuit of biblical prophecy coupled with human curiosity leads us to want to pull out our calendars and figure out dates and times for the fulfillment of certain prophecies that we've studied and that we know about. And in particular, we think about how many people have tried to predict the date on the calendar when Jesus Christ would appear and take the church to heaven with him. And apparently, even after that takes place, there are going to be people who are trying to figure out when he will return after the church is gone. Those who come to know him after the rapture, during the tribulation, will still be wondering when the return is going to be. And what we're going to see in our verses that we study tonight is that Jesus made it clear no one knows. And that's the title of our study tonight from Matthew chapter 24, and I hope you'll open there. And it'll be helpful always when we're in these studies to have your Bible open so you can make notes and underline there in your copy of the scriptures. But we're talking about how no one knows. And remember, when anyone tries to set a date or a time on the calendar for some future fulfillment, you're going to remember tonight's message and most importantly, the words of Jesus, because he made it clear no one knows the specifics. So we're going to begin reading where we last left off. Let's pick up in verse 32 of Matthew chapter 24. And we'll read verses 32 and 33 where Jesus said, Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the doors. So we'll stop there because we're going to try to walk through one or two verses at a time and break it down into bite-sized chunks. Now remember that when we left off last week, Jesus had reached the culmination point of tribulation describing his own return to the earth. And now he is stepping back from that panoramic view of, of the tribulation in prophecy and he resorts to a parable. He says, learn the parable of the fig tree, and it is a very short parable. And a fig tree would have been something that his readers or listeners uh, would be very familiar with. It was a common tree in Israel. In fact, most households would have a fig tree in the courtyard or somewhere on their property. And it was, uh, it was the source of delicious and nutritious fruit. And it was also a source of shade. If you have ever seen uh, fig leaves, you know they're very broad and wide. And so people would sit under fig trees to avoid the intense uh, sun rays of that Palestinian heat in summer months. And Jesus is referring here to the signs on the fig tree, which after having been barren during winter months, and if you've ever had a fig tree, you know, they look barren and dead during the winter months. And he's referring here to a time when the branches become tender again because the sap begins to flow in the spring and there is the reappearance of these leaves which begin to bud after the tree's time of barrenness. And he says that when you see that tenderness return to the branches of the fig tree and you see the leaves starting to grow again, it, it, it's a symbol of, a harbinger of, summer is on the way. Spring has come and summer is near. And summer represents the harvest. When you think about a fig tree, it was the time when you picked the fruit from the tree because it yields through the summer months. And harvest is an interesting metaphor that is used in scripture. There are certain places in the scripture where harvest refers to the ingathering of those who are saved, which is a positive thing. You remember in Matthew chapter 9, Jesus said, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. He was referring to the harvest of those who need to be saved. But harvest can also be a metaphor for judgment and final condemnation. Because Jesus uh, himself talked about a time when 
when the wheat and the tares grow together but will be harvested and the wheat separated from the tares and the tares bundled and thrown into the fire. So harvest has a very powerful meaning in, in the teaching of, of Jesus. And so he says from this parable of the fig tree, short as it is, springtime is when the branches get tender again and when the leaves begin to reappear. And then in verse 33, he transitions, he shifts his focus to interpreting the parable. And he says, in light of what I've just said about the fig tree and spring indicating that summer's just around the corner, so you also, do you see it there? He said, so you also. And then he tells them the meaning of the parable. Now, before we um, look at what I believe he's saying here, I wanna to present to you one possible interpretation. And that is that the fig tree in this parable in verse 32, many people believe that Jesus used this fig tree as a symbol for the nation of Israel. Back in Matthew chapter 21, Jesus was walking with his disciples past a fig tree and he cursed the fig tree and said, may you never bear fruit again. And the fig tree immediately withered just from his speak, having spoken a curse over it. And there are many who believe that that was symbolic of the curse that he would pronounce over Israel for their rejection of him. So from Matthew 21, 18, some believe the fig tree then becomes the symbol for the people of Israel. And now he is speaking in chapter 24, verse 32, about the fig tree now having tender branches and leaves starting to appear on its limbs again after the barrenness of a long winter. So some people believe the fig tree refers to the rebirth of the nation of Israel. We're gonna talk about that a little bit later. But then there are others who believe that the fig tree simply represents the conditions that will exist before the return of Christ. And just as there are signs on the fig tree in verse 32 that summer is coming, so Jesus is saying here there are going to be signs indicating that the return of Christ is near. Summer on the fig tree, the return of Christ on God's prophetic calendar. That's why he said, so you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. So when he says in verse 33, so you also, we've talked about this before, how when he addresses his remarks in chapter 24 to you, as though he's speaking to those in his immediate audience, like they're going to be around when all of these things uh, take place, we have to remember that he was speaking through that audience and to an audience in the prophetic distance. Uh, an audience that as far as we know does not, is not even around unless uh, we are very near the outbreak of the tribulation. So remember when he says, so you also, we don't believe that he understands his immediate audience that were with him on the Mount of Olives 2000 years ago to be around during the tribulation time. But instead he was speaking to them intending this message to be recorded by Matthew. And uh, of course, Luke has parallel passages, but picked up and utilized by those who come to Christ during the tribulation. And we've already talked about that at considerable length. But when he says, when you see all these things, the question we ask about verse 33 is, and if you'll underline it, all these things, underline that, what are all these things? All these things are the things that he's been explaining in all the previous verses. In, for instance, in verses four through seven, Jesus foretold the increase of false messianic claims. When someone says, I am the Christ, he talked about wide-scale spiritual deception. Many are going to be deceived. He talked about increasing global volatility. He talked about an increase in geological disturbances, such as earthquakes. And then he said, after describing all of those things in verses four and five and six and seven, as though those are just the beginning of the tribulation 
experience. We read this in verse number eight where he said, all these are just the beginning of sorrows. Now, I underlined sorrows, but I want you to know that is a, a weak translation because the word that is translated sorrows in the New King James, it's, it's really the word in Greek that refers to the pains of labor that a woman experiences prior to giving birth. So the New Living Translation, I like how it puts it. Jesus says, but all this is only the first of the birth pains with more to come. So in verses five and six and seven, he says the beginning of the birth pains, the first part of the tribulation, and yet there's more labor to come before the birth takes place. All of this, of course, is metaphorical. What are the continuing of birth pains as the tribulation intensifies? Well, the universal uh, hatred of, of the tribulation saints and of Israel during the tribulation. Verse 15, he talked about the abomination of desolation. Remember, that reaches back to Daniel 9, which is when the Antichrist will go into the temple and uh, command people to worship him as though he himself is God. He will defile the temple in that way. And that'll mark the halfway point of the tribulation. And then after that, there's going to be an unprecedented assault that he will lead, a global hatred and, and outright pursuit of the Jews, trying to exterminate them in, uh, through all means possible during the last half of the tribulation. And I think it will also include this unprecedented assault against tribulation Christians. He talked about an upheaval in the sky. The light of the sun and the moon and the stars will be impacted by these things. And then it all reached its pinnacle point with the return of the Son of Man on the clouds of heaven. Now he's talked about all of these things. So everything I've just told you are these things. So if we look at it, again, I want you to see how I've displayed it. Verse 33, so you also, when you see all these things that I've inserted, which is everything he described in verses four through 26, which I just summarized, he says, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the doors. So then the question is, what is near? When you see all these things, know that it is near. What is near at the door? Well, in order to answer that question, I wanna remind you that what prompted the Olivet Discourse, which is what we're studying, Matthew 24 and 25, was a question the disciples asked him. So if you don't mind, I wanna just draw your attention back to verse three, where the Mount, uh, this Olivet Discourse started. It says, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming? and of the end of the age. See, I've underlined those things, of your coming and of the end of the age. Okay, so we looked back at verse three. That, that was the question, the response to which by Jesus became this lengthy prophetic sermon or discourse that we're studying. So if we go back down to verse 33, keeping verse three in mind, the question they asked him that got this whole conversation started, I want us to look at it this way. Verse 33, so you also, when you see all these things, know that it, and I've inserted that it must be the coming of Christ and the end of the age. That's borrowed from verse three, that it is near at the doors. So what Jesus was saying is, just as there are signs that the fig tree will give you the tenderness of its branch and the reemerging of leaves after a barren winter, Jesus is saying to those who live through this tribulation period, when you see all of these signs and cataclysmic upheavals and all of the things that he's described in verses four through 26, those are the indications. Those are the tender branch and the leaves starting to reappear that summer is near, that the return of Christ is near. So the parable simply reaches back and says that all of these Phenomena of the tribulation are the indicators of springtime on the branches of a fig tree. 
It's really amazing when you put all of this together. So we'll, let's come back now to this parable of the fig tree. And, and I, I, I want to insert some interpretive things here. In verse 34, Jesus says, Assuredly, I say to you, this generation, and I've inserted here, that witnesses the budding of the fig tree will by no means pass away till all these things take place. <laughs> so we're going to think about this because this verse right here has been the object of much debate. And many believers are divided over the interpretation. It is certainly not foundational to Christian understanding. There's room for disagreement, just as I believe there's room for disagreement on when the rapture will take place. I wouldn't want to break fellowship with anybody over the differing interpretations over some things of prophecy. But uh, it, I want you to think about this. If, as some people interpret, the tenderness of the branches of the fig tree that he referred to in verse 32 and the leaves starting to reappear on its limbs. If that does indeed depict symbolically, of course, the rebirth of Israel, then you have to interpret verse 34 with the rebirth of Israel in mind. Now remember, this was spoken 2,000 years ago. And the rebirth of Israel did not take place until the 20th century. So if the parable of the fig tree is really all about the rebirth of Israel, and he's saying here that this generation who witnesses the branch becoming tender and the leaves starting to reappear on the fig tree, if, if that means that there's, there will be a group of people who lived when Israel was reborn, then there will be some who were alive during that time who will also be alive when the tribulation begins. So I, I'm, not, I'm not surmising this, and I, I'm not saying I believe that's the accurate interpretation. But I do think it, it's, for lack of a better word, it's fun to explore as a possibility. So if we just take the interpretation that the parable of fig tree in, in Matthew 24, 32 is referring to the rebirth of Israel, then let's read it this way. And I've just inserted these things <clears throat> hypothetically. It would be understood as Jesus saying, assuredly I say to you, this generation that witnesses the rebirth of Israel, which happened on May 14th, 1948, will by no means pass away or die Till all these things, the things he talked about in verses 4 through 26, which are the events of the tribulation, take place. <laughs> so I just wanted you to understand what that would mean. And many people believe this. Uh, they believe that, that this refers to the rebirth of Israel and it means that, that there will be a group of people who were alive on planet Earth when Israel's reborn, May 14, 1948, who will also be alive. They will not pass away, as the verse says, before the tribulation begins. And so think about this. It lets you see someone was born the same year that Israel was reborn, sometime in 1948. That means this year, in 2021, they're going to be celebrating their 73rd birthday. And that would be a whole lot of people. And if it's someone who was born prior to 1948 and was alive when Israel was born in May of 48, it just means you add a year to 73 for every year prior to 1948 they were born. And that can take you all the way up to people who are older than 100. So if, you're, if, if we are assuming this interpretation that the fig tree parable is about Israel being reborn. And then Jesus comes back and says, I'm telling you, the generation that witnesses that will not pass away until all the things I've talked about in chapter 24 come to pass. <clears throat> this has led many people to believe that the rebirth of Israel is the sign that, that the rapture and, and therefore the tribulation that will follow it have to occur within the lifetime of a group of people who were alive in 1948. Well, it's fun to look at that and speculate about it. 
But if you step back from that for a moment, and, and when he says, this generation will not pass, the generation that sees these things, generation in the Bible can, can be understood to mean different things. In the Old Testament, sometimes generation is referred to as a period of 40 years. And then there are other times where the word generation refers to the entire lifespan of an individual. And then there are times in the Bible, both Old and New Testament, where the word generation simply refers to a specific group of people. For instance, in Matthew 12, 39, Jesus made this statement. He said, a wicked and adulterous generation demands a sign. And in using generation in that context, he was referring to the unbelieving Jews who were right there among him during his time on earth. And then many of you will recall how the apostle Peter in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9 spoke to believers and said, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. And so that word generation refers to all believers as a group of people. And so I happen to believe that, that it's that last use of the word generation that is intended by Jesus here. And instead of interpreting it as the, this generation who sees these things, instead of interpreting it as the, a group of people who were alive when Israel was reborn, I believe that the tender branches and the leaves budding again on the fig tree, I believe that that is tied to these things, which are the events of the tribulation. So simply put, Jesus was saying that, that someone who witnesses the tribulation events that he outlines and all of these manifestations that will take place on planet earth and in the atmosphere. And you can add to, you can add to what he said in verses 4 through 26, all the seals and the trumpets and the bowls of revelation. Jesus is saying, whoever's picking this copy of the scriptures up and reading this, if you have seen all of these tribulation signs taking place, you need to know you're in springtime and summer's coming. This generation, he's saying, will not pass away until Christ returns. So that's my interpretation. This generation does not necessarily mean those who were alive in 1948. It means those who were alive during the tribulation because they're the ones and only they are the ones who will see these things which he referred to in the parable. All right. Let's go ahead to verse 35. Jesus says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Oh, I love this verse because it's his way of reminding those who were hearing him. And of course, it was written down by Matthew, inspired by the Holy Spirit. And we're reading it here in 2021. It was his way of saying, everything in this world is going to pass away, but what lasts forever is the word of Jesus, which we know is the word of God. So heaven and earth, heaven and earth they're gonna pass away. But he said, my word will last forever. Now, in this same book of Matthew, Jesus was countering, he was re responding to the Pharisees who accused him of undermining the authority of scripture. And Jesus' response to their attack that he did not uphold the authority of the sacred writings of the scripture he said in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 18, for assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. And we believe those are references to small characters in the Hebrew alphabet of, of the Old Testament. So here's what we see. Matthew 5, 18, he says, till heaven and earth pass away, Matthew 24, verse 35, he says, heaven and earth will pass away. But in both of these verses, speaking of heaven and earth passing away, in verse 35 of Matthew 24, he says, but my word will last forever. And in Matthew 5, 18, he says, every jot and every tittle will come to pass. Both of these 
are strong proclamations on the part of Jesus that the Word of God cannot be altered, the Word of God cannot be erased, the Word of God is eternal, and it will abide beyond the destruction of our atmosphere and planet as we know it. And just to remind you, heaven and earth will pass away. If you'll remember when John in the book of Revelation saw the new heaven and new earth, he says in chapter 21 and verse one, I saw a new heaven and a new earth because the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, which is a clear reference to the destruction of our sky and atmosphere and our planet as we know it, which will give way to our new eternal home, the new heaven and new earth. Now, back to this idea of God's word being eternal. You can go and find other references to this in the scripture. For instance, in Isaiah chapter 40 and verse eight, God says, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. And then in Psalm 119, verse 89, forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. So you see, both of those verses refer to what Jesus was saying here, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will last forever. So this whole idea of the fig tree, tender limbs, the leaves starting to reemerge, Spring is here, summer is coming. Summer is the final harvest. Summer is the, metaphorically, summer is the return of Christ that he's already talked about. So, assuming there'll be people picking this up and reading it uh, during the tribulation and at intermittent times through the tribulation, they're gonna be as curious about the return of Christ as you and I are curious about the appearing of Christ when we go up in the rapture. The curiosity We'll get the best of us if we're not careful. But in verse 36, this is what Jesus says. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. And see, no one knows in that verse. That is the title of the message. No one knows. And these are the very words of Jesus. So, Remember, we looked back in the third verse and they said, when will these things take place? And he's giving them all of the signs and he's telling them how it's going to end. But he circles back around and in verse 36, but he said, don't be deceived. No one is going to predict the date when this is going to happen. Now, this statement in verse 36 that no one knows the day nor the hour it is parallel with uh, something Jesus said to his disciples after his resurrection, uh, just before he ascended back to heaven. And we read about it in Acts chapter one. In verse six, it says, therefore when they had come together, they asked Jesus saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, look at what Jesus said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. So you see there how that Acts chapter one, verses six and seven are a parallel to Matthew 24, 36. No one knows. <laughs> so there's no use in trying because it, I heard the pastor I had when I was a teenage kid. He said, if somebody happened to get it right in choosing and predicting the date of the rapture, Jesus would change it just to prove them wrong. <laughs> and of course, we don't believe he's talking about the rapture in chapter 24 of Matthew. We think he's talking about the end of the tribulation of the return of Christ. Suppose someone rightly predicted that on the calendar. And the joke is he would change it just to prove them wrong because he said unequivocally, no one knows these key prophetic events on the calendar except the Father in heaven. Now, if you step back for a moment and you think he's talking here about the return of Christ, which is at the end of the seven year tribulation. And we know that the church, uh, if our interpretation is accurate and the church is raptured before the tribulation, and yet the book of Revelation teaches there'll be people saved throughout the tribulation time. Um, 
due in large part to 144,000 Jewish evangelists who will be sharing Christ around the world and the two mighty witnesses who minister with the same supernatural manifestations that Moses and Elijah did, um, people will be getting saved during the tribulation. So let's just assume that someone you or I know um, is not saved and that would, we all have people we know who aren't saved. And let's say the rapture happens and those of us who are saved, we are taken up to heaven where we are kept to enjoy fellowship with Jesus for the seven years of tribulation that are happening down on the earth. So someone whom we know, we witnessed to, we shared, they get saved after we disappear and they don't know where we went and they pick up the copy of scripture and they're thinking, well, I know when my friend or my loved one disappeared and that had to have been the rapture and I missed out on it, but now that I'm saved, I need to figure out when is Jesus going to be returning? If the tribulation's already started, you see what I'm saying? If somebody is, is um, putting the pieces together and they start studying the Bible as a tribulation believer, then they may be able to deduce a seven-year timeline. And let's just say that they get saved two or three years into the tribulation and they realize that that whole abomination of desolation spoken of in Daniel 9 when the beast goes into the temple and demands that everyone worship him as though he is God. Uh, and Jesus, of course, spoke about that in Matthew 24, 15. And based on Daniel 9, that's going to happen in the middle of the 70th seven. If somebody gets all of this together in their head, they'll be able to conclude that when he appears in the temple, uh, it marks the halfway point of the tribulation. And so someone who's mathematically savvy and prophetically in tune as a new believer during the tribulation, they could probably estimate when the seven-year tribulation is going to end. And if they didn't get a good start, they can start timing it, if not from the rapture, from the abomination of desolation when the Antichrist appears in the temple, they know that'll be three and a half years. Uh, it's just probable that there are going to be people who have a good idea about when the tribulation will end and when Christ is going to return. But notice that what Jesus said in, in, uh, in the passage we looked at was he spoke specifically of a day and hour. And so he, he's saying that it's not just about um, the, the date on the calendar. He said that no one can predict the specific time on the clock, the time of day when it will happen. So his idea is whether you're talking about the date or the time of day, yes, there are gonna be people who have a good idea when the tribulation will end, especially once that halfway mark comes and the Antichrist violates his covenant and turns on Israel, there'll be a general idea. The return of Christ is near. And if they read Matthew 24, coupled with Revelation, seals, trumpets, and bowls, they're gonna know this thing's gotta be close. But Jesus said, no one's gonna be able to predict it with pinpoint accuracy. Now, now just, just wanted to put this, you don't have to write all of these down because we'll revisit each instance, but I'm going to show you in a moment how many times Jesus made it clear that no one knows. For instance, look at this chart, verse 36, where we are right now. He said, no one knows the day nor the hour. Verse 42, Jesus said, you do not know what hour. Verse 44 of this chapter, at an hour you do not expect. And then in chapter 25 in verse 13, he says, you know neither the day nor the hour. So question, are, are we really understanding? Are we getting the point uh, tonight that no one knows? I mean, how many times does he have to say it? And did you notice in verse 36, he says, not even the angels of heaven know it, just the Father. Now, in the New King James Version, The King James Version, New King James Version, are, are drawn from what is called the majority text. But the majority text does not include what have been found, which we call the, the earliest manuscripts. Other translations of the Bible utilize manuscripts which 
predate the manuscripts which were utilized in the King James and the New King James translation. So for instance, the New American Standard Bible utilizes the earliest manuscripts. And in the earliest manuscripts of Matthew's Gospel, something is included in verse 36 that is not included in what is called the majority text manuscripts. And so I want to display this for you in the New American Standard. Verse 36, Jesus says, Of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven. Look, this is what is included in the earliest manuscripts. Nor the Son, but the Father alone. Now, this, this is amazing because what Jesus is saying here is that while he's on the earth, He's saying when it comes to the, the, the date, the hour, the time of the return of Christ himself, he said the Father alone has this in his realm of knowledge, not the angels, not even Jesus knows that. So the question is this, if Jesus is God and yet he excludes himself from having the knowledge of the specific time when he will be returning to the earth, then is this not in some ways a contradiction of his assertion to be equal with God as God? Well, it is in no way a contradiction because this is one of several texts that leads us to conclude that during Jesus' incarnation, that means from the time he was placed in Mary's womb all the way through his crucifixion, that he voluntarily yielded certain facets of his omniscience unto the Father. And omniscience means that attribute of knowing all things. And in voluntarily yielding some facets of him, his omniscience to the Father just during his incarnation, it placed upon him some limitations of knowledge he never ceased to be God. He never forfeited any aspect of his deity. He simply accepted certain limitations on his knowledge. And then we believe that after his resurrection, those limitations on his knowledge were removed and he embraced full omniscience with the Father following his resurrection. And just as he said, in verse 36, there are some things reserved in the Father's knowledge alone. In the last verses of Matthew's gospel, after the resurrection, Jesus said in Matthew 28, 18, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And some have inferred from verse 18 that when he said that, he was referring to the restoration of his full measure of omniscience as God. I'm just going into that to say if you are reading from a translation where he says, no one knows the, the day nor the hour, not even the angels, not even the Son of God knows, then how could he be God and not know certain things? And it just refers to the fact that while he was on the earth as a human being, he voluntarily, this is a mystery that we can't fully understand, but he voluntarily yielded certain facets of omniscience to the Father. And there is no doubt in our minds that he now possesses full omniscience, having been seated at the right hand of God where he is today. Let's press through. Jesus then takes us back to the Old Testament book of Genesis. And he says in verse 37, as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and they did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, the focus here is not just on the fact that the people in uh, Noah's day were ungodly people, but it's on the fact that they, they were caught off guard. They were, they were caught unsuspecting. Despite the fact they had every reason to know there was going to be a flood, it had never rained before, so they didn't believe it. So their lives were going on 
undisturbed. Even though Noah worked on the ark for 120 years, even though according to 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5, he was a preacher of righteousness. He wasn't just a, a, a construction expert, uh, but he was a preacher. And as that ark began to, to uh, be uh, built and constructed and became uh, visible to anyone who lived within miles of, 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 of Noah, that ark became a sign, letting them know it's time for you to get ready. But their lives went on without interruption. And that's what Jesus said. They continued to eat and drink and marry and, and give their children in marriage. Life went on without interruption until the flood came and took them all away. And Jesus says this is exactly how the coming of the Son of Man will be. So think about it. Uh, many people who live through the tribulation will have witnessed the, the sudden, the abrupt, the unexplainable disappearance of Christians. The rapture's gonna happen and what are, what are the people who know you who aren't saved? What are they gonna think about what's happened to you? And what are they gonna think about so many churches being empty the next Sunday? Because the Christians have disappeared, they've all vanished. Well, tribulation people will have lived through that. And then they will have seen the sign of Daniel with the Antichrist, going into the temple, all the plagues foretold by Jesus in this chapter and told by John in Revelation. There will have been all kinds of famine and natural disasters. And just like the people in Noah's day, what Jesus is saying, the people who lived during the tribulation, who are persistent in their unbelief, they're going to be just as busy as they always were. They've got the mark of the beast. They're buying, they're selling. Sure, there's going to be hardship. They're going to, there's going to be wide-scale death. But even those who are spared, who endure all of the ravages of the tribulation, and I'm talking about the unsaved, they're still not going to be prepared for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And to me, I, this makes perfect sense to me. Because with COVID that, that emerged last March of 2020, it revealed just how quickly our world can be shut down, how quickly people can be unemployed, how quickly tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands can be killed by a plague. And yet there's been no wide scale turning to God as a result of this pandemic. No, quite the contrary, people's hearts have grown hardened. And I was thinking about it just this week with the hacking of the Colonial Pipeline Company uh, computer network that has created this huge disruption in the gas supply for states like Georgia, North Carolina, Virginia. And um, you would think that we would all realize just how we're just moments away from having our whole lifestyles interrupted. The way just a momentary gas shortage can cause people to panic. Are there people looking up to God and saying, God, forgive me that I've never thanked you for gasoline in my car and you're the source of everything I need. I repent of my sin and come to Jesus Christ. No, I haven't heard of that happening anywhere. Our energy supply, our food supply, our economic interconnectedness, our very health and our life, all of these are fragile and can be threatened literally within minutes. We have no idea just how vulnerable we are. But how many people are turning to God through this time of unrest and instability? Very few. And Jesus said this is exactly how it will be during the tribulation, just as it was in the days that Noah lived before the flood. The hearts will be just as hardened as, as they were then during the tribulation. Verse 40 says, then two men will be in the field, one will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken, the other left. Many people have read into these two verses that this must be the rapture, which means if this is the rapture, he's placing the rapture at the end of the tribulation, which would mean these two verses lead you to conclude there's a post-tribulation rapture instead of a pre-tribulation rapture. But we've got to look at the context of this. The context was the example of those in Noah's day being caught off guard 
despite all the warning signs they had before the flood. So what I want us to do is to look at verses 40 and 41 in the context of verse 39, where he was talking about those who were caught off guard by the flood. Let's read it this way, and I've inserted some interpretive tools. Jesus said, and just as those in Noah's day did not know until the flood came and took them all away, understood in judgment, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Remember, the flood took them all away. Verse 40, then understood when Christ returns, two men will be in the field, one will be taken, and if we can borrow from, took them away, in verse 39 is referring to judgment, then the one that will be taken is taken in judgment, and the one who is left will be left to enter into the millennium. When Christ returns, two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken in judgment, the other left to enter the millennium. So when you read it that way in its context, verses 40 and 41 with verse 39, the taking away is not the same taking away of the rapture, which will have occurred seven years earlier. No, no, no. The taking away is removed for the judgment of all unbelievers before the millennium. And those who are left are left to enter into the millennium because they are those who will have survived the tribulation as saints who've been preserved despite all of the atrocities and persecution that will have been perpetrated against them. So the unbelievers in Noah's day were swept away in judgment. The unbelievers on earth when Christ returns will be swept away in judgment. It's the idea of being taken away. The floods took away the unbelievers when Noah's family was on the ark and the return of Christ will bring judgment that takes away unbelievers and sentences them to their destiny. Now, let's contrast this with the rapture and I'll just leave this up for a little while. In the rapture, the ones who are taken are saved. The ones who are left will face the tribulation. But at Christ's return, which is what is talked about here in verses 40 and 41, the ones who are taken face judgment. The ones who are left are the saved who will enter the millennium. And there are seven years between these two events. All right? So I wanted you to just see that. We don't have time for us to write all of that down, but... You can certainly revisit this in the archives. I want to close, though, with verses 42 through 44. Jesus says, Watch, therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. And remember, he is speaking to his disciples right in front of him, but we believe he was speaking through them and past them to an audience that will have this gospel of Matthew during the tribulation. He says, But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. And his illustration here is that if someone who owns the home knows that the thief is coming at two in the morning, he's going to be sitting up prepared and probably have a few friends waiting for the thief to try to break in. Because if you know when the thief is coming, you'll be prepared. Now, Jesus is not referring to himself here as a thief. He's just using this as a metaphor to say that since you do not know when Jesus is going to return, you need to be ready at all times. And this will be a word of admonition to tribulation believers. Be ready, be ready, be ready, because you do not know the exact time when he's going to return. Now, if Jesus intended this exhortation for those who will be reading it during the tribulation, which means not for us because we will have been taken to heaven, um, that does not mean that we cannot apply it in principle to our lives. In fact, it's been preached and, and, and given relevance to believers like us who live in the church age for many, many years. Even though Literally, this may refer to tribulation saints always standing prepared for the return of Christ to the earth. You and I can say the same thing about our Lord's appearing when we'll be raptured or as far as that goes, death in general. None of us knows the day nor the hour 
when we'll be called home in death. None of us knows the day nor the hour when the trumpet will sound and, and the be living believers will be raptured. None of us knows the specifics on the calendar. And just as he said to watch and always have your guard up and be mindful that it could happen at any time, I believe that we can glean from this that ours is to be a life of watchfulness, which means every morning we wake up, we put our feet on the floor, we say, Lord, this could be my last day of life. I want to make it count for you. Or Lord, this could be the last day before the trumpet sounds. And if the trumpet sounds, I just want to be ready, waiting, and watching, uh, lest you call us to heaven today. But in this context, we believe that these are words of admonition to encourage and admonish tribulation believers to always be watchful for the return of their Lord. Father, thank you for letting us study these powerful verses in Jesus' sermon. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will show us ways to apply all of these principles to our understanding of, of your great plan, how you work in providence and sovereignty over the affairs of this world, and more especially the fact that you, you, you leave nothing to chance or fate or luck or to coincidence, that you have already determined how all of this is going to end. And we thank you, God, for giving us insight into your word to understand just what we, we believe you intended by putting these words into your Bible. And I pray for everyone listening tonight that we will have all been encouraged to have had this exposure to the Word of God, which lasts forever. In Jesus' name, amen.